Well, good morning. Welcome to Kaiser Christian Church. Those of you here with us, those that are joining us online, we appreciate you being here with us this morning. Uh, we have a special gift. Uh, Pastor Steve Knox is joining us this morning, and we get a chance to uh, hear from him a little bit later this morning. Um, and encourage you to you know, jump right in and partake this morning, all kinds of fun stuff going on. And we appreciate the ability to be able to be here in the house of God to celebrate and lift praise to him. Let's start our morning with a praise song. Kaiser Christian Church. Good morning. Good to see you again. I can't remember when I was here last, but I did uh, visit you some time ago and enjoyed being with you and preaching. And Pastor Eric asked me to come back uh, today while he's off to Chicago, um, working on denominational business and uh, keeping us all going. So uh, it's just good to be back with you and worshiping with you. We just sang, I stand in awe of you, and so if you're able, please stand, and we will continue to worship our Lord. Turn to Christ. Place your trust in God. Lean into spirit. Will you pray with me? O God of miracles and truth, bless us on this beautiful spring day as we gather for worship with the power of your Holy Spirit. Reveal your presence in our midst and open our hearts and minds to receive your miraculous love. Strengthen our faith this day that we may go forth as witnesses of your miraculous love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll now continue to worship in song.
Now, if your birthday is in the month of April, please stand or raise your hand so we can celebrate you as we sing together. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Well, it's such a wonderful day because it's a gift. It's the present. And I know that no matter what I feel, where I'm at, I'm never alone. You know, the Lord is with me at all times, in all places. In those moments that we can sing praise, hallelujah, there is such wonderful glory. And those moments where we feel down and despair and not sure what's in front of us, I know I have the ability to lean on and know that my Lord is, is with me. We have many things to celebrate, and it's wonderful that we have the ability to come together as body of Christ in order to, to bring forth that praise. If you would join me this morning in prayer. Lord, we know you are with us, and we are so thankful. Lord, we know that you ask us to pray for others all around the world. Lord, we know that your hand can reach to places that we can never fathom. You have the ability to change hearts and change minds, Lord, and thank you for giving us the opportunity at times to be that spark, to be that moment in somebody's life that they can see you. Lord, we also thank you for the ability to praise you. We are made in your image and we are placed here on earth to carry on your message. Lord, we know that you are with us. Lord, we know that you are with our families and our friends. And we ask that you extend your hand of calm to everyone that is within our sphere of influence. And Lord, we thank you for the ability that you've given us to learn from your teaching, from the stories, from those th things that we hear from others around us, from our leaders within our churches. Lord, we also know we thank you for the ability to pray. And this morning, Lord, we come to you with the prayer that your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
we take this moment during service to pray blessings on the children. Just as those before us prayed blessings for all of us when we were children. And some of us know we needed that when we were children. And so if you would join me this morning as we lift the children in our family, in our community, and up in God's name. Dear Lord, thank you for entrusting us with your children, just as we are children of yours. We ask, Lord, that we can be an influence, we could be a role model, that we can give the words that you put in our hearts in order to lift up your children, where we ask that you help us to help them walk in your light. Lord, we thank these things and we pray these in your name. Amen. I like this pulpit. There's lots of room here. Spread out all my things. Even got a pencil sitting here and a, and a, a straight pen if I want to pin something. You've got lots of, lots of space here. I like that. Because I usually have lots of paperwork and things I want to spread around. And, and uh, so I wish pulpits could tell their stories, you know. Um, because uh, there's, there's so many things the pulpit has seen out in the pews and, and has uh, witnessed to. Um, and uh, usually pulpits are, are part of the history, you know, of, of the church. And um, if all the pulpits could just tell us their stories. Well, um, I'm honored and, and humbled to be here uh, in this pulpit. Uh, you have a wonderful and wise pastor in Eric Free. Um, I watched him grow up, uh, came, to, came over to uh, Silverton Church uh, f as he was a youngster and was part of our congregation when I was uh, a younger uh, minister there. And, um, and he, is, uh, he is a blessing, I know, to your congregation and to our region and indeed to our denomination as disciples of Christ as he uh, works to um, to improve what we do and and deepen our witness. I want to start today's uh, Easter season sermon with a story that I'm borrowing from Paul Harvey. Any of you remember Paul Harvey? Oh yeah, yeah. So I'm not alone. Um, when I was young, I remember listening to Paul Harvey on the radio. He was a unique radio personality, and he gave us our daily news, and he added his own flavor of comment, and then often he would tell a story, a true story from around our country that was interesting. And one day, I remember he told this story about these uh, airline baggage handlers, and you know, they were taking the luggage out of the, out of the luggage bay, and they were tossing it, as they do, roughly tossing the luggage around. And at, at some point, one of them said, wait a minute, one of the luggage they had flipped and tossed and was an animal carrier. He said, hold on, and we, they went and they looked inside the carrier, and to their horror, the dog inside was dead. They knew that their jobs were going to be uh, over, that uh, there might be lawsuits. They were so worried, and they came up with a plan. They got word to the woman, passenger, that um, her, her dog uh, had been um, accidentally, the carrier was sent to another airport, as sometimes happens, but that, but that uh, be assured, um, we will have it We'll find it and we'll have it delivered to your home. So the woman went home and she waited. And um, in the meantime, these guys, they went out to the pet shops and they looked and looked and they found 
a dog uh, that they bought that was a dead ringer, so to speak, um, for the woman's dog. <laughs> Looked just like him. And so they got that dog, put it in the carrier, and, and they delivered it. They had it delivered to her home. Knock at the door. She opens the door. The delivery guy says, uh, here's your delivery. She looked in the carrier, and she said to the guy, that's not my dog. And he said, what do you mean? And she said, my dog is dead. I was bringing it home for burial. <laughs> Oops. This woman, of course, was no fool. Dead is dead, and she's not going to pretend otherwise. As I, I remember my friend, my cowboy friend, Craig Holliker, in the first church I served, and he he often said interesting things to me. I'll never forget after a funeral, he came up to me and he said, Pastor, you know what? There ain't none of us getting out of this thing alive. And I always remember that, the stark reality of death. This is what we encounter as we approach the Easter story. The women who came to the tomb first, uh, they were no fools. Dead is dead. And they show up, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and others. According to Luke 24, they expect to find a dead man in the tomb. That's what you find in tombs. Graveyards, graveyards can be beautiful places of peace and, and of remembrance, but they're always places where the living bury the dead. I had a friend named Harry many years ago uh, where I served a church in Washington State, and he used to tell me that he enjoyed living in his particular neighborhood because he was across the road from the cemetery. And I said, why, why do you enjoy living right there? And he said, well, the neighbors are so quiet. They're so quiet. The women in Luke 24 came early Sunday morning to a place that was so quiet, where Jesus' dead body lay. They're sad, they're upset, no doubt, they're grieving. But then they are surprised. No body. And then a strange voice saying, why do you look for the living? Or why do you look for the dead um, among the living? Uh, 24, chapter 24, verse, verse 5. I like how it says, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. It was unbelievable. Dead is dead. Anyone with half a brain knows that. Later that day, Jesus' followers start, a couple of Jesus' followers start down the road to a village called Emmaus. And I love the story of Emmaus, the stranger that joins these two, walks with them, interprets scripture, explains the puzzling events of, of Christ's death and resurrection. They come to a little inn where the stranger breaks bread with them. And now, now they recognize him. The stranger is Jesus himself, the risen Christ, alive with them this very moment. Let's pick it up in Luke 24, verse 33. That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you frightened? Why do, you, do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. 
While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. This is uh, an amazing story. One of the verses here that stops me in my tracks is verse 36. While they were all gathered together talking about all these amazing things, it says, Jesus himself stood among, stood among them. I love that line. Jesus stood among them. Let's stop there a moment and let that sink in. We are a church because he is alive and stands among us. We forget that, I think. We think maybe it's the, you know, the, the table, the, the, the choir loft, um, the piano or an organ or a guitar that makes it church. Those are all things that help. They help make it church, but that, they're not the essence. The pews, the, the lovely carpet, those are all good. Hymns are good. Preacher in a pulpit is good. But what is the essence? The essence is he stands here among us. That's what makes us church. All the other helps us recognize that and lift that up, the glory of it. That first Easter Sunday, church was actually kind of a pitiful thing. According to John's gospel, the apostles were hiding out. The door, door was locked. They were hunkered down like frightened rabbits. Nobody was leading hymns. Nobody cared to light a candle, read a scripture, or sing kumbaya. This was not a friendly fellowship with an open door and a bold mission. This was a church at its worst that first Easter morning. Could this even be called a church? No sanctuary, no pulpit, no choir, no plan, scared, defensive, absolutely nothing going for it. Well, well, except for one thing. Jesus himself stood among them. That's what made them a church. One of my favorite preachers is Will Williman, chaplain at Duke University for many years, and he told a story about his first church out in rural Georgia. He says, I was fresh out of seminary, eager to be a good pastor in my first parish. I was in graduate school at the time, commuting out to the hinterlands on the weekends. Most Sunday mornings at dawn, it was a tough trip out there from Atlanta. I used to say, this trip only takes 30 minutes, but it takes us back 30 centuries. It was a long way from Atlanta to Sewanee, Georgia. My first visit to the church, I found a large chain and padlock on the front door. Put there, I was told by the sheriff. The sheriff? Why? Well, things got out of hand at the board meeting last month. Folks started ripping up carpet dragging out the pews they had given in memory of their mothers. It got bad. The sheriff had to come out here and put that there lock on the door until our new preacher could come and settle things down. Welcome. He goes on to say that rather typified my time at that church. I would drive out there each Sunday just praying for a miraculous snowstorm in October, which would save me from another Sunday at that so-called church. I spent a year there that lasted a lifetime. I tried everything, says Williman. I worked, I planned, I taught, I pled, but the response was disappointing. The arguments, the pettiness, the fights in the parking lot after the board meeting were more than I could take. It was tough and I was glad to be leaving them behind. You call yourself a church, I muttered as my tires kicked gravel up in the parking lot I'm on, on my last Sunday among them. A couple years later, while visiting at Emory University, I ran into a young man who told me that
that he was now serving that church. My heart went out to him. Such a dear young man, only 23. They still remember you out there, he said. Yeah, I said glumly, I remember them too. Remarkable bunch of people, he said. Remarkable, I said. Their ministry to the community is a wonder, he continued. That little church is now supporting, one way or another, more than a dozen of the troubled families around that church. The free daycare center is going great. Not too many interracial congregations like them in North Georgia. I could hardly believe what he was telling me. What, what happened? I asked. I don't know. One Sunday, things just sort of came together. It wasn't anything in particular. It's just that when the service was done and we were on our way out, we knew that Jesus loved us and had plans for us. Things fairly much took off after that. I tell you what I think happened, says Williman. I think, I think that church got intruded upon. I think someone greater than I knocked the lock off that door, kicked it open, and offered them peace, the Holy Spirit, forgiveness, and mission. And now they are called church. Jesus himself stood among them. This came as a shock to the apostles on that first Easter Sunday. Verse 37 says they were startled, they were frightened, figured this must be a ghost or a spirit or something. I mean, Jesus died, we know that. This must be some, is it our imagination? Is it, what, what's happening? Jesus could see they were troubled, confused, so he said, verse 39, look at my hands and feet, see that it is I, myself, touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. In their joy, it says at verse 41, in their joy, they were disbelieving. It was a whole mix of emotion. This is a lot for anyone to deal with. Who could handle such a, a puzzle? Imagine what they're thinking. Jesus died, and everybody knows dead is dead. Then Jesus appears. A vision, perhaps. A ghost, maybe. He sits down, he has breakfast or, or lunch, I don't know, maybe brunch. I don't know what time it was exactly at that point. But a ghost doesn't have brunch. <laughs> so maybe he never died in the first place. But he says, see my hands and my feet nail pierced. Crucified men don't stop by for brunch. No one survives crucifixion. The truth began to dawn on them. Jesus, who died, is now somehow, some way, alive, really alive. So alive that you, you can touch him. You can smell fish on his breath. Resurrection is not what we thought it was. We could always be comforted with the idea that deceased loved ones live on in our memories, at least. And we could even believe there is some spirit or soul that lives on in a mysterious ghost-like way, mystically, invisibly, peacefully out there. But Jesus shows us that there is something gloriously touchable about the resurrection. This is the amazing claim of the New Testament. It's a great mystery. The future existence of God's people is not less than earthly bodies. It's more. This flesh and bone is not going to be traded in for some ghostly wisp of smoke. No, says the New Testament, we're trading up. Up to something imperishable, glorious, powerful, and real. Solid, real. It's kind of almost like what we are now is a wisp of smoke compared to what we will be. I don't get it. It's a mystery. I have no way to explain it. But this is the claim of the New Testament. 
Jesus lives solidly, bodily, somehow lives, and that makes all the difference. Stands among us, somehow, in some realer than any real we've ever known way. Pastor Eric told me that he's been sharing this threefold theme with you. I, I uh, wrote down what he said to me. In this series of sermons, he said, we notice that Jesus flips the script. The typical church model is, first you believe, then you begin to behave how you believe, and now you belong. You join a church, and you belong to a people and to God. But Jesus welcomes us into faith. First, we belong. There's that sense of he stands with us. He's among us, and we realize there is an us. I'm not alone to realize this. And we, we find ourselves among other people who are also in awe and wonder and even worship. And we join together and we belong first. And then, and then that affects how we behave and how we live and how we have a sense of purpose and mission now. And we believe. We believe. Uh, they said they were disbelieving for joy. They, they had this joy and this experience, but they, they don't even know how to grasp this yet, but they'll keep working on it. And isn't that true to our lives? I believe, and yet I'm still working on it. It's, it's a lifetime process and journey, and I keep evolving and growing in my understanding and in my belief. I keep yearning to know more and to understand better and to deepen my faith. And so that is ongoing. I like how Pastor Eric has unpacked that and seen how this works out in a way in, in, our, in our journey of faith. I uh, went to a conference many years ago in Grand Rapids. It was called a Faith and Writing Conference. And there are a lot of authors, Christian authors and, and, and people there and, and, and classes and, and, and uh, worship services and so on. And it was really fun and fascinating. Um, it was the last evening of this conference, and I was uh, having a Kentucky Fried dinner with an English professor from the University of Florida, and he was sharing his excitement to hear the novelist John Updike who was going to speak to all of us that evening. Did you know, he said, that he writes poetry also? And I said, no, I didn't know. I, I only knew that Updike wrote a lot of novels, some of them, some of the great novels of our, of our American culture, some of them a little racy, but, but the guy definitely was an amazing writer. The professor continued, he says, you know, when I die, my one request for my funeral is that they read one of Updike's poems. It's called Seven Stanzas at Easter. Well, a little while later, we went to the field house and we got our seats. John Updike came in and he gave his talk. He shared his own spiritual faith and journey. And then finally, he read Seven Stanzas at Easter. And I looked over at that professor knowing that he was very happy. Let me share that poem with you. Make no mistake, if he rose at all, it was as his body. If the cell's dissolution did not reverse, the molecules re-knit, the amino acids rekindle, the church will fall. It was not as the flowers, each soft spring recurrent. It was not as his spirit in the mouths and fuddled eyes of the eleven apostles. It was as his flesh, ours. The same hinged thumbs and toes, the same valved heart that pierced 
died, withered, decayed, and then regathered out of his father's might new strength to enclose. Let us not mock God with metaphor, analogy, sidestepping transcendence, making of the event a parable, a sign painted in the faded credulity of earlier ages. Let us walk through the door. The stone is rolled back, not paper mache, not a stone in a mere story, but the vast rock of materiality that in the slow grinding of time will eclipse each of us the wide light of day. And if we will have an angel at the tomb, make it a real angel, weighty with Max Planck's quanta, vivid with hair, opaque in the dawn light, robed in real linen, spun on a definite loom. The final stanza. Let us not seek to make it less monstrous for our own convenience, our own sense of beauty, lest Awakened in one unthinkable hour, we are embarrassed by the miracle and crushed by remonstrance. I had to look up remonstrance. I didn't remember what that meant. It means like rejection or complaint. Rejection. So I think he's saying here, let's not seek to make this monstrous reality that changes everything Let's not seek to make it less than what it is for our convenience, our comfort. Lest awaken in one unthinkable hour, we are embarrassed by the miracle and crushed by our rejection. It is an amazing poem. And, and I don't know if Updike got all these things exactly right about the resurrection, even a brilliant wordsmith like Updike cannot contain and define and describe precisely this grand mystery. It's too large, it's too much. But I love what he's aiming at. The realness, the solidity, the reality of that event that changes everything. He stood among them. That's why they're church. That's why we are church. Amen. And our hymn of response, Be Thou My Vision.
Good morning on this great, beautiful morning. <clears throat> For many people, today is a day to quit procrastinating and finally sit down to fill out our income tax forms. Thanks. <clears throat> I don't want to embarrass you or myself, so I'm not going to ask who is still hoping those forms will somehow get filled in and show we will be getting a large tax refund. Yay. Whether your taxes were filed months ago or you have material stacked and waiting, or you're operating under the I'm waiting until tomorrow because I do best when I'm under pressure mantra, we all know April 15th is the day we give the U.S. government our account of the financial realities of our life. It's altogether different when we think about the financial side of our life and the church. No one stands at the offering plate with a checklist to make sure you've made a contribution. No one checks to see what percentage of your income is freely offered. And yet, week by week, we have the opportunity to share our financial resources, our time, and our talent to help build God's realm on earth. Each week, we remember how Jesus called his disciples, expecting them to walk away from their former lives in order to follow him in his ministry of teaching, healing, and sharing good news of God's love. What will you offer this day? Remember this scripture, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let us pray. Receive these gifts, loving God, as signs and symbols of our love for you and for the beloved children you have created. Thank you for all who have freely offered these gifts. Help us use each contribution as a rung on the ladder which reaches ever higher, allowing us to stretch to do your will, both here and around the world. Amen. When we come to this table, we come to another time when Jesus was with his disciples. A little bit earlier than what Steve was just talking about, but a very important moment in what we believe. You know, I often think about what it might, might have been like for those first disciples, you know, when, when Jesus is talking about his broken body and his shed blood. They don't get it. They don't really understand, you know, what that means. We have the, we have the value of knowing what it means, you know, and knowing what happened. And that's really what's important about this table is he is, he is still among us. We have to feel that. We have to know that in our heart. And in our mind, Jesus is alive. And he's talking to us just like he talked to those disciples back in that day, you know. Let's pray. Living God, living Christ, and living Spirit, open our hearts that we may recognize your presence in our midst. Let us eat this bread and drink this cup as a sign of Christ's presence. As you have fed and cared for us in giving us this meal, so let us feed and care for others. In your name, amen. And we remember on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, blessed it, and gave it to, him, to them saying, take and eat, this is my body, broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup and blessed it, poured it out, and gave it to them saying, this is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember Christ's death until he comes again. Let's partake of the Lord's Supper. Love. 
love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the A few announcements. Food bank is tomorrow. So I'm sure. Yes. Amen. Okay, other things. Uh, we're needing treat providers for Sundays. There's a sign-up sheet back on the door back there. Your flower orders are due today. It's in all caps on here. Today. <laughs> Dina would appreciate having them all today. Uh, we're, we have a work party scheduled on May 11th. We, uh, we've got a little outside work to do around here. It's looking a little ragged, but we'll be able to do that on May 11th. Let's uh, join in our benediction song then. Jesus.